Lord, bless these that have come to study the eternal word of God. And bless those that from this place shall study with us the word of God throughout the earth. We thank you for truth. It is the truth that sets us free. It sets our minds free. It sets our spirits free. It sets our emotions free. It sets our bodies free. The truth of God sets us free. We thank you for the eternal truth of the word of God. Bless these and open up their spirits to receive. And not only to receive, but it shall produce fruit in their lives. And they shall go forth and do all that God has commanded them to do. For your blessings, we thank you. It's a great joy to have you with us for this very special uh, study time. We have been very thrilled to be studying the, the, the Christian foundations. Uh, we, we live in a time of a little confusion in that we have great knowledge in some areas and, and uh, a lot of lack in other areas. That there, there are those who seem to know so much about truth and there are those that seem to know so little about it. And we got to get truth out there for everybody. Uh, as I have said, we need one million teachers here in, the, in our country today. We need people that will go out and proclaim the truth of God to multitudes. And uh, if we are limited in our possibilities of getting out, then we should give the truth in our whole community, in our own neighborhood, and bless God, especially in our own family. We are bearers of truth. Can you say amen? amen. We are studying uh, Lesson 21 on page 116. Lesson 21, page 116, why we believe in witnessing. The first reason that we believe in witnessing is that witnessing is an integral part of our salvation. It is part of our salvation. Uh, you might be a Democrat and never try to make a Democrat. Of course, you'd be a poor Democrat. Uh, you might be a Republican and have no idea that you would ever cause anyone to be a Republican. But you cannot be a Christian without a desire in your heart to cause somebody to be a Christian. That is not possible. In the records of the Bible, in John chapter 1, verses uh, 40 and 41, the first disciple Jesus ever had was named Andrew. Andrew was a very particular person that had jo joined John the Baptist. We don't know how long he had been a Baptist. Uh, he was for sure a baptized in the River Jordan. But one day his teacher stood up and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Andrew was one of these clever persons that understood new opportunities. And he very quickly left the Baptist church and joined the Christian church. For the simple reason that he had found one that his own leader said superseded him and was greater than he was. And reaching for the highest and the best, he reached for it quickly. That potential is in every one of us, but so many do not live up to the potential that is in them. When we receive a greater revelation, we should not live in the lesser revelation. Because if you do, you're not living according to all the light that God has brought across your pathway. How many believe in living in all the light you have? Amen. All right. And so it is native to Christianity that when you become a Christian, you immediately seek to cause someone to be a Christian. And we will under, we'll understand that a little better as we go into why you wish to witness. In fact, the number one reason why we have to witness is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28 and verse 19, and also Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew, chapter 28 and verse 19, He said to those that were believers in Him, those that were his membership, 
that belong to him. He said, now you go and teach all nations. So a Christian is under a command of its commander in chief that when you become a bona fide believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, then you have a responsibility to your commander in chief that you seek to go and teach all nations. And as I have said, where your nation is could be in your own neighborhood, your own county, your own state, your own America, or it could be to the uttermost parts of the earth as it has been with so many. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 and 16, the Lord in his last words uh, to his disciples before going to heaven said, now listen, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If you would permit me to change that one word world, I would appreciate it. Go into all your generation and preach the gospel to every creature. You cannot do anything about a past generation moaning about it and, and calling your, your, your forefathers bad names will not save that generation. They don't live anymore on, on planet earth. But you cannot do anything about a, a generation to come if the Lord tarries. But I'd like to inform you, there are four billion, between five and six hundred million more that are living on planet Earth right now. There are more people living this moment than have ever died. There are more people living this moment than have ever died. And those people are to be discipled. If the proper, the proper burden ever hit the church that we were supposed to evangelize this generation of four billion five hundred million human beings we would have the greatest moral religious economic political revolution the world has ever known it would change the face of the earth if the total Christian body accepted the challenge of its commander-in-chief and said, this is my generation. I will not give the devil my generation. We're expecting in this generation for supernatural things to take place. I am believing God for 100 million Chinese. More than has ever been saved in any generation known to man. But one billion Chinese are there. We are asking God that he'll raise up someone somehow that will reach those people. It may be by the means of television. We don't know. But we know they're there. And it's our responsibility, our command that we might reach them. You say, why should we... Uh, seek to uh, to uh, evangelize others and uh, to cause others to become converts. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 14, at the top of your page there, it's because the Master says that we are the light of the world. Now, this means that those that are not evangelized are moving in a spiritual darkness where they do not know the way to go to enter heaven. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Then almost in mocking them, uh, he said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He said this at the north end of the Sea of Galilee. And Suffolk is the, is the city on the hill right behind you. And Suffolk was there at that time. It, it, when it was so hot down over 500 feet below sea level uh, around, around the, the, the Sea of Galilee, they could climb the hill to Safed, and there it was much cooler and more comfortable. And especially uh, the, uh, the, the aristocrats uh, of, uh, of, of the community and the intellectuals that were giving themselves to, to, to penetrating studies, they would go up to Safed. And so when Jesus was talking to the people in front of the Sea of Galilee, he could say, a city uh, set on a hill cannot be hid. And they were looking at that city. 
suffered that you can still see. And it cannot be hid. He was telling them that when you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot hide. Are you here or not? <laughs> that there's no place to hide. If you want to hide, get out of this bunch. Yeah. I was down at the local post office one day a few years ago. And, and uh, it's quite usual, no, to wait for quite a time before anybody pays any attention to you. And so I was standing there fiddling my thumbs trying to get the mail. And, and uh, nobody wanted to help me. It didn't look like. And I just relaxed a little too much, I suppose. I just said, hallelujah. <laughs> I was doing it for my own spiritual refreshment, you know. I had three people waiting on me before you could count to four. <laughs> I don't know where they came from, but I want you to know they got to that window. And so I found out immediately that when you give a little testimony, it really wakes people up <laughs> and gives you better service. Try it in some of our restaurants. It would help. <laughs> Not all of them. <laughs> some of them. <laughs> he says, let your light shine. Where is it to shine? Before men. You know, a lot of us would like for our lights to shine before God real strong. Well, you don't have to shine for him. He knows you too well. He said, let your light shine before men. That they may see your regenerated, it says good works, your regenerated life. And that they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. If there's anything that causes people to want to live for God, it's the observing of a good life, of a good person, of a holy person. If you know it, say amen. amen. When we speak of being the light of the world, the Lord Jesus gave us a, a reference to that. It's in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4 and verse 21. One of the first of the parables to the believers, he said the candle signifies the Christian testimony and witness in a darkened world. He gave another uh, good uh, illustration, and we'll speak of both of them, the, of the Good Samaritan. Uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and which shows you who you are to talk to, who you are to witness to. And, and so, and given the, the illustration of the candle, he signifies what we are in this world, and then he shows you who we're to talk to. Uh, and the candle, he says at Mark 4.21, he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or a bed, or not to be set in a candlestick? Now, he was showing you that no Christian can say he cannot witness or testify. If we're all candles, every one of us, then uh, every one of us gives light. Every one of us gives light. And if our witnesses are light, then every one of us ha has to do it. Well, there are no exceptions. You can't say, well, let the boys do it. I let the young girls do it. I let this one do it. No, if you're God's candle, your light's got to shine. And, 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 and it don't mean just walking down the street smiling and saying, my light's shining. No, no, that's something else. Uh, your light is shining when you're telling people about Jesus. That's the light, the eternal light that we are, we're, we have under, under consideration here. On 117, at the top of the page, uh, we read more about this candle. He says this candle is a man. In Proverbs 20 and 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. In 1 Corinthians 2 and 11, it says, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? So the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God that is within him. So he's saying that when he speaks of this candle, he's really talking about a person, about, about a human person, about a born again person that knows the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm number 18 and verse 28, it says, For thou wilt light my candle. <laughs> How do you want your candle lit up? I'd like to have mine made bigger. How about you? When you go to these weddings and you see two little candles and the big one in the middle, you say, Hey, that's me in the middle. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the big one there. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. And so our candle is our witness before the Lord. It is the power of our witness. And that's the reason we should say, Lord, increase the light of my candle. 
uh, so that we can penetrate further and further in, into the darkness. And as we were reading in Matthew 5 and 15, it says, men don't light a candle to put it under a bushel. And uh, you know what would happen if you did? Yeah, you'd burn it up. Yeah, you'd burn the thing. If you got a candle on it and it was lit, you'd just burn it up. It would be gone. So whatever you're hiding under, you're going to destroy it. You see, if, if it's your church or something else. Uh, whatever you're, you're hiding your light under, you're going to burn the thing up. It, it's not going to be able to, to exist. Uh, you're not helping it any. He says, but you put it, you put it upon a candlestick, and, and, uh, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. He's only trying to show you that when you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are something, that you are a light, that you are a brightness, and that you do bring light. In the world that we live in today, it would be a mighty sad place to live if there were no Christians. I tell you, I wouldn't want to live there. If there was no light at all, if it was total darkness, how great the darkness would be. Thank God for every light, for every Christian, for every denomination, for every pastor, for every, every church, for every light, we thank God for it. And, and we want to keep on thanking Him for it and tell Him to add more candles and give us more light. This lighting is a divine work. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Now, we, we, we know there's a double meaning here. Uh, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he caused light to come where there was darkness. He brought forth light uh, out of that darkness. But in your life and my life, we were in darkness. And God caused that light to come up out of the darkness of sin and the darkness of wrongdoing. God caused the light of heaven to come and it shined in our hearts. And it gave the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? It tells you exactly what happens to us when our light begins to shine. It gives people the knowledge of the glory of God. And, we, and it's reflecting in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. The lighting is also a separate work. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Now, I have never been able to figure out <laughs> a couple of things. And one is this. How, how can a man that's a wonderful Christian, a beautiful Christian, go and, and go into equal business, a partnership with a person who is a complete unbeliever? I've, I've known of a lot of people doing it, haven't known of much success with it, uh, but I could never in my mind figure it out because you've got to be so close together. And if you don't, the business will go to pieces. And then how are you going to be close together? He's blowing cigarette smoke in your, in, in your face. And he's cursing the one that you love called Jesus. And I just can't figure out how you can do it together, you know? How you can do it. I don't believe you can do it joyfully together. It would have to be painfully together. I am painfully in business. <laughs> yeah. And one worse than that. Of course, is when a, a beautiful Christian, a young man, marries a complete non-Christian woman, you see. And, and the two of them say, now we're going to become one. Well, pray tell me how darkness and light becomes one. Uh, you turn out these lights and say, now, now the light and the darkness are one. And no, the light's all gone. You turned it off. Then you go switch on the light. You say, where'd that darkness go? Nobody knows. It's dead. It's gone. Light, light destroyed it. Light is a destroyer of darkness. You don't know where it goes. It's simply gone. Light penetrates and causes darkness to be no more. Well, how in the world can, can you have a uh, can you can you have a young man and a young woman marrying one another, and, and and saying the two have become one and they're going to raise a family together? And the Bible says that light and darkness don't even mix. 
And then you make your own problems and you harass the preacher for 40 years about it. And he had nothing to do with it. Well, that part's free. I'm sorry. <laughs> Poor preachers. It's the lawyers you harass, I think. I don't know. Anyway, don't do it. Don't do it. Light is light and darkness is darkness. And let's don't try to put them together. And don't you think you're clever enough to do it? Because you're not as clever as God and he can't do it. And so don't you try to do it. And all the people said, Amen. So don't be unequally yoked with anybody, whether it's in business or, 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 or whether you say, I'm already doing well. If it's marriage, stick with it. And pray that the, dark, the darkness will go away and the light will come into the life of the one that's with you. But in business... See how soon you can sell out your part or buy out the other one and let the whole thing be God's light. Now, if you're working for somebody else, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> if you're working for somebody else, then you're working for somebody else. It's no, none of your business how they, how they do. As long as you work there and they pay you a salary, you do your job. But you're not having fellowship there. You're making a living. Is that all right? All right. The lighting is, is a personal work in every, in every man, every woman. Ephesians 5 and 8 says, ye, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, and walk as children of light. And so it is a personal work. This lighting up within us it is a personal thing that God does for each one of us. He doesn't do it by the family. He does it by the person. And I know he puts a little more wattage in some than he does others. <laughs> I mean, have noticed that. Yeah. Well, pray for more wattage. Bless God. Very, very significant is your C on page, uh, on, on page uh, 118. Uh, the placing of the candle. I, I want to speak to that. In Matthew 5 and 15, it says, A man doesn't light a candle, put it under a bushel, which could be a, a commercial activity, uh, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all those that are around. And, and so he doesn't light it and hide it, whether it be under any type of a situation, uh, but he leaves it into an, an open place. And, and the candlestick there speaks of our service to mankind. That we are there and, and uh, the, the, the candlestick is there to serve. We are a service community. That when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and become His servants, then we are part of the service is to tell others about Jesus. Do you feel it in your own heart? Amen. All right. Now the shining candle. The candle, it lightens the darkness. It shines before men. It glorifies the Father which is in heaven. And point number two on page 118 the, the, the whole matter is shifted in a, in, a, in a way that's really penetrating. You call it the Good Samaritan. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 30, And Jesus answered, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. They stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And there came down a certain priest. I want you to put a little circle up there in, in Luke, chapter 10, verse 30. It says, A certain man. Uh, Jesus must have known about it. In verse 31, a certain priest, he passed on the other side. He represented uh, uh, the, the leadership of religion. In verse 32, also a Levite, uh, when he was at that place, came and looked, and he passed on the other side. He is the, uh, he is the layman. The Levite was the layperson uh, of, of, of the religion. So you had the priest, and then you had the layman. A, a certain Samaritan, the people that were hated and disliked and not loved, he came, journeyed it. When he saw it, he had compassion on him. Notice the word compassion just got born. And verse 34, and he went and bound up his wounds, poured oil and wine, and set him on his own beast. That meant he had to walk. Brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took two pence and gave them to the host and said, Take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. And so here we find a man that's typical of all sinners. And he was on a journey. And he fell, he fell among bad people. And, and he got hurt. He got pushed down. And he needed help. And religion, in its, in its uh, greatness, looked upon him and said, hey, that's too dirty to look at. 
Just like a harlot or, or like a man that's been in prison or, or like a person that's an alcoholic. He says, I can't look at that. That's too bad. And then a professional layman, he comes by and says, well, I, I can't stand that either. But then there they came a, a person that's called the Samaritan. Uh, he wasn't even of the Jewish faith. And, and he had no, no, no standing in, in the religious circles. But it says he had compassion upon him. And through this compassion, he, he, he gave him everything he needed. He washed his wounds. He cleaned him up. He gave him food. He took him to a place of shelter. He paid for his expenses after he was gone. And he said, and I want to tell you something else. If there's any more, when I get back, I'll pay that too. And so he showed you what we should do. Who is our person that we should minister to? The one that's in need. The one that's hurt. It could be your next door neighbor getting a divorce. It, 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 it could be the man down the street. It could be the woman across the street. It could be the person you're working with. It's the one that's in need. The, the one that's in need is the one we should witness to, that we must help. The one that's close to us. Don't, if you go a certain road, God's going to bring you in contact with certain people. And when you get there, they need you. How many know that? And, and so God is no respect of persons. Whoever they are, they, they, need, they need God's love. In John 3, 16, it says, God loved the world and gave his only begotten son. A great scripture in the word of God is in Matthew 16 and 26. It says, if a man gain the whole world and lose his soul, what will it profit him? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? The value of the soul cannot be measured on the face of this earth. Not one of you tonight can be measured for your value on the face of this earth. And that means every human being on the face of this earth is worth more than the whole of the earth.